an American flag, right? Hey, Russell, can you hear us? Yeah, we got on the computer now, too. I can hear you. All right, nice. we're all ready. Hi, Tech. Go ahead, Kevin. All right, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, uh, again, is the um, Board of Education meeting for <laughs> January 11th, 2021. We have been in closed session for the last hour, uh, a little more. Uh, Charlie, if you can call. Ms. Drake. Here. Mr. Cook. Here. Mr. Roby. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Mr. Westfall. Present. Mr. Kerber. Here, we have a quorum. If you can join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America. America. And, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you to our wonderful IT team for <coughs> up that American flag now. We're making progress. All right. Um, communications, Tom. Uh, just the president's comments. All right. Um, so just a couple of things uh, this evening. Um, well, really, uh, for one, for now, I'll, I'll save uh, the other comment uh, for later when we uh, uh, get into other parts of the meeting. Um, but just wanted to, uh, as, as uh, many of you know that are logged on tonight, um, we will be uh, discussing uh, later in the, the meeting uh, the plan, the, the return plan uh, for uh, starting um, the, in second semester. Um, but as we look to start returning students to in-person learning again, starting next week, um, I wanted to just take a couple of moments and remind our community uh, of where we have been with this, uh, specifically that we have um, had a plan um, since July to return students to school in small controlled groups when it is safe to do so. We understand how hard this time has been on everyone involved. Uh, we really do empathize with that. Um, still, it is also important to note that we have followed our plan with the health and safety of our students, staff, and overall community in mind. The plan that uh, we have had in place uh, since uh, the beginning of the school year was to start in remote, as we did on August 31st, pushing back the planned start date of the school year to, at that time, the, the goal was, again, to remind everyone, was to um, you know, provide some additional time for us to get PPE in to hope that uh, things got to the point where we could start in four to six weeks uh, into the school year. We monitored those conditions for those four to six weeks. If it was safe, we were going to start to bring back students in small groups. Uh, that, that was the plan. That plan was begun to be implemented on October 26th with our multi-need special ed students having, coming back in, having come back into the building for in-person instruction. We continue to bring, the plan was to continue to bring back students every couple of weeks based on conditions. We did have to take an adaptive pause in November, like dozens of districts around us, as the COVID-19 positivity rate spiked substantially. We had families fill out an educational choice form in early December to tell us if they intended for their students to return to in-person learning or to continue with remote learning. Uh, we we uh, used that, that feedback as part of our uh, continued uh, uh, planning for dates. Now we are adjusting some of those planned details in terms of the timing to get students back into the classroom safety based on these new timeframes for in-person learning for this school year. However, uh, this is not a new plan. This is not a plan that has just been created. This is the current implementation uh, of the plan that uh, again has existed since the beginning of the school year, uh, which started to be implemented in the fall, had to pause, and now we'll, we will look um, with much anticipation to be able to reinstitute uh, in-person learning as we go forward. So again, thank you to everyone having been involved in this, uh, you know, all the work that's been done on the administrative side. Dr. Abril and his team have done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, we owe them uh, a great amount of gratitude for all of that work. And uh, we will uh, look to share that information later on in tonight's meeting um, uh, and uh, provide more details then to the community following the meeting and going forward uh, as we approach those dates that will be announced shortly. Um, moving on, 4.01 board salutes. Uh, does anyone have anything uh, for board salutes this evening? Nothing. All right. We don't have any special welcomes or recognitions uh, this evening. So we'll move on down to 5.01 um, public comment. Uh, as we have been doing, uh, we will continue with the same procedure for public comment this evening. 
the district 202 protocol and procedure is to allow two minutes per uh, per person for public comment and up to 20 minutes total for these comments subject to the board president's discretion this is based on board policy we have received uh for this meeting 83 public comments uh that's dating back since the december 14th board meeting um, to avoid any suggestion of impropriety, editing, et cetera, uh, Director of Community Relations Tom Hernandez will read uh, these emails um, in the timestamp order that they were received up to 5 p.m. this evening, which is our um, published cutoff. He'll read them word for word, minus any appropriate redactions uh, for privacy, uh, subject to the stated time limits for each comment and for public comment overall, two minutes per comment again, and not to exceed 20 minutes total. All public comments will then be posted on the district website as part of the information for this meeting with the appropriate redactions to remove personal email addresses and names or information identifying specific students or staff. Uh, uh, we, to the, for this meeting, we received uh, uh, 83 public comments, as I said, 79 generally in favor of returning to in-person learning, four generally supporting continuing and remote learning are the general parameters. Uh, I will uh, give uh, Mr. Hernandez a heads up when we're um, nearing the end of that 20 minutes and uh, we will go forward from there. So, Tom, if you are good, you can start when you're ready. All right, sir. First one is from uh, Stephanie Youngward and she writes, I'm writing this letter on behalf of my five year old daughter. When e-learning began, I had hoped it would be a short hiccup in a, to an otherwise successful first year of school for her. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. My daughter is struggling. My daughter is not learning. My daughter is falling behind. Children need to be in school and deserve quality educations. Those are their rights. Private schools have been in person with little to no issues. States with bigger districts are also back in school. If I had the funds, I would gladly pull my daughter and enroll her in a private school. But unfortunately, we are at your mercy. My daughter is unenthusiastic about learning, loathes zoom and finds every reason to walk away from her computer as she is distracted five-year-olds are not meant to learn this way please open our schools and give us a choice next is from mandy gerhardt just watched the board meeting live and wanted to comment that heather drake rolling her eyes the whole time when the public comments were being read was a complete disgrace to parents and students struggling in this district just because a majority of the public comments didn't fit her agenda she could have at least listened and tried to sympathize with everyone who put their time and emotions into trying to explain how we can no longer sit back and watch District 202 destroy our children. Absolutely disgusting to watch and prove she doesn't deserve a spot on the school board. Another one from Amanda Gerhardt. During the board meeting tonight, I found it deeply concerning that when the board members were asked if they had any questions or comments regarding the return plan, not one of them had anything to say. That's okay, just sit there in silence while the school district continues to not have an actual plan to get our kids back in the classroom. Great job guys on continuing to make sure kids don't see the inside of a classroom before the end of the school year. Next from Robert Sanchez, I'm writing to express my dissatisfaction of the lack of professionalism at the board meeting last night, particularly board member Drake during the reading of the public comments. These letters need to be read aloud. That's the point of them. The previous board meetings in which comments were not read and were not conducted in the spirit of what an, an elected school board is supposed to represent. If board member Drake or any other board member cannot handle the public scrutiny brought upon them by their lack of leadership, vision, or professionalism, then they should resign immediately. From Kelly Wegner, these children need to have the option to be taught in a classroom. Teachers are deemed essential. I am also an essential worker and encounter thousands of people a day. I take the proper precautions and have been fine. Teachers can do the same. The mental and emotional well-being of our children is at stake right now. This has gone on far too long. Get these children in a classroom and please get all of the children, not just certain grades, into a classroom as often as possible. It is discriminatory to have some children go back and not others that want to. Kindergartners need to be in school just as much as a high schooler. Instead of being afraid of the virus and running away from it, you need to learn to live with it. We cannot function this way forever. Figure something out to get all of the kids back in the classroom. This is why you are here. You have failed the students of District 202. Uh, the next one is from Greg Colby. Uh, 
and he says the decision of this board to keep children forced out of an in-person learning is getting more absurd every week. Enough already. What is your agenda? The education and well-being of the children should be first and foremost. Clearly, it is not. The wishes of students and parents should be considered. They are not. The wishes of the teachers should be considered as well. This is also not the case, as I will point out later. One thing became very apparent as I watched your meeting last night. The comments in favor of in-person learning far outweighed the support of the forced online policy. Now, you may argue that the comments are anecdotal and not a true representation of the pulse of the community, although we all know that is very unlikely. But what was most striking was the actual content of the letters that were read aloud and many others that were not read but available on the PSD 202 website. Those in favor of in-person learning were full of data, scientific studies, CDC guidance, Illinois law, and expert testimonials, often with corroborating links provided. The exact things you as educated individuals should already be keenly aware of and following. Follow the science is the mantra shoved down our throat, but for some reason, the board has chosen to ignore it. Contrast those comments uh, with the two I heard from parents who supported the district's policy. One was from a parent whose fears arise from having family members with COVID and knowing someone who died from it. That's anecdotal and not scientific evidence. And you as educators should understand the difference. I'm certain that uh, nowhere in your plan to return will there be a requirement for students to return to in-person. Online will always be an option for that parent or any others who are not comfortable with that option. I too know dozens of people who've had the disease, me and my family included, with little to no ill effects. That too is anecdotal and equally irrelevant. The other letter was from an individual whose argument was essentially along the lines of thanks for closing the schools because I support the teachers. An ironic statement as is evident shortly. Interesting side note to this one, this individual admittedly does not have a child in, the district, in a District 202 school. It is an easy thing to say when you don't have skin in the game. The one thing missing in any of the policy support letters is any facts, data, studies, et cetera, to support their position. Why? Because they don't exist in any credible form. The facts, recommendations, guidance, data, and studies overwhelmingly support in-person learning. And that is two minutes for that one. Next is from Michelle Colby. Uh, below is the definition of what the word plan means. Feel free to scroll through the definition to see if what you have done matches any of the descriptions. And there are several pages of one word definitions. And then she continues to say, you have said over and over, you have a plan. It is clear that you do not. If you, do, if you did, you would have made a follow through plan. What if the numbers go up? What if a child tests positive? What if a teacher tests positive? Nope, the numbers went up and you sent everyone back to square zero. I would think by now you would know to ask for help. Go to other schools that have stayed in person since the beginning and have done so successfully. You keep saying we are too big. You keep saying other schools are going back to remote. Well, not all of them are, and we have never been not remote. My kids have been home now almost 300 days. They have not been inside a school for 275 days. You let the IEP and kindergartners go back for two weeks, so don't tell me we went back. My kids did not, and the other 98% of kids did not have a chance to go back. I noticed in April's letter after the last meeting that he says the district considers guidance from the CDC, IDPH, and the local health departments as a resource. But wait, haven't you said you're following the science in day one? Now you're considering guidance? Maybe it's just a play on words, or maybe you continue to fill us with false hope and lost dreams of a fair and high quality education that the residents of District 202 clearly pay for. Your mission statement, in case you forgot, Plainfield Community Consolidated School District 202 is a creative school system in the Southwest Chicago suburbs dedicated to ensuring that all students learn, achieve, and grow to their maximum potential. And that is two minutes for that one. Next is from Samaya Richardson. With the end of the year approaching and the district not having a public legitimate plan of return or an instructional remote learning process, we as parents would like to know what's in store for our children next year and of course now. We understand 
that this pandemic is new to everyone, but when will that stop you being used as an excuse and allow us to move forward? With being one of the larger districts, we should have been leading with solutions rather than waiting for something or someone else. We as parents have the right to know what this plan is or will be. This will also help some to prepare for the 21-22 school year mentally and financially. Some will want to move since property value will drop as we will be known as the school district that was not prepared. Others will want to look into private education since those schools have managed to stay open and follow a protocol. Maybe we should consider touring those schools and asking for help. With the amount of resources that have been shared through science and media, there is no reason we shouldn't be back in the class. These are the same resources used to shut us down, so why can't they be used to reopen? Families and teachers should have the right to stay remote if they or their loved ones have underlining health issues that prevent them from working, but fear shouldn't be one of them. We're nine months into a virus that is not going anywhere, and the mental and physical well-being of our children and staff isn't even being addressed. It is going to take something drastic to happen for district to address and manage this? Even with a vaccine being distributed, no one can or should be forced to get it. Plus, it is not being offered to anyone under the age of 16. What will be the district's rules and regulations for this? People are just tired of feeling helpless and letting those who do not have children on our district make the decisions. How is it fair that you can even be on a board that doesn't affect you personally? When will kids come first? When will the teachers that want to come back be able to? When will the district start accepting responsibility for their actions? Numbers will go down and the virus might become manageable, but this doesn't change the fact that our district was not prepared and failed the children and teachers miserably. How will we bounce back academically? And that's two minutes for that one. Next is from Suzanne Jonke. In response to the recent board meeting where it was stated that we do that we indeed do have a plan, I'd respectfully disagree. Yes, we do have a theoretical return plan, but it is incomplete without an actual date for return. Again, many other districts in the area have a date to return. Parents need enough time to plan for what a hybrid model means to their family schedules. I'm sure the bus drivers would like to know a date. They can go back to work also. The longer you wait to set a date, the more valuable in-person time is lost, which is a tragedy. Remote learning does not work for my children. In-person learning five days a week is what is essential. Be a leader and stop hiding in the corner. Open the schools. Next is from Ryan Malberg. A lot of parents are saying that the school board should open schools immediately based on survey results. However, many of us chose hybrid so that we would have the option of keeping our children remote should the board decide to open schools when the numbers are high. Our family was one of those that selected hybrid so that we would have the option to keep our kids home in the case that numbers continue to be this high. When there are only two choices on a survey, one being remote and the other being hybrid, I'm sure we are not the only family in the district who chose hybrid so that we could switch our kids if needed. People need to understand that decision. We also want to commend the board and Dr. Abril for keeping safety at the forefront of the decision making. While remote learning is not ideal, I would rather have my wife, a teacher in the district, and children healthy and alive. Next, from Kelly Wagner. As I would like my children to go back to school in any capacity, I strongly want them in a classroom full time, five days a week. Why is it quote unquote safer for only a couple of hours, a couple of times a week? Just like jumping into cold water, it is better to do it fast instead of easing in. Also, it is not discriminatory to have some kids go back and is it not discriminatory to have some kids go back and make the others wait? Why is one age group's education and mental emotional well-being more important than another? Every stage of education is important. You have taken away so much from our kids. Give them back the chance to be successful in their futures. Uh, next is from Angela Olson. You have a chance to make right what you made wrong at the start of the school year with the new semester approaching. Even our healthy children and families are falling into mental health issues due to the extreme measures being taken by your decisions to not open the schools. 
You can sit and try to blame others, CDC, IDPH, Pritzker, all you want, but other schools are having success with being open and there's plenty of science and research that goes against whatever science and research you are using to justify your decisions. I'd like to remind you that the numbers that you have so heavily relied on are continuing to be inflated as the same person's positive test can be counted as multiple cases, as well as the antigen test getting added into the mix, which are not very reliable, as well as probable cases. Yes, probable cases. It makes me question if you are really paying attention or are just being spoon fed what the news and unions want you to hear. Have you ever wondered why these changes with our number tracking keeps occurring? I won't go into it here, but it's healthy to question and challenge. Most schools stopped following the numbers for this exact reason. I did not appreciate your shaming tone in your last board meeting towards the families and advocates that know what is best for their children and community. The conditions you continue to allow are inhumane. I am all for choice and giving the families that remote learning that work for them that option. However, for most, this is not effective. Our children are suffering and this will have long and deep consequences if you allow this to continue. I see this every day as the area's clinical director. I beg you to open your doors for full in-class instruction and giving remote choice to the others. We're in the middle of a major mental health crisis. We have to stop the teen suicides. Our little learners have lost their lust for learning and are becoming anxious or aggressive. We know children are not learning as much with remote learning where they can social, emotional, and mentally engage with their peers and teachers. These kids need to get back into the classroom. School is the safest place for our children, can, uh, our children can be. We know now because of science and research that schools and children are not super spreaders like the media once attempted to indoctrinate into our minds. Again, I beg you to open your schools. The mental well-being of our families and children need you to make this tough decision. We are more in danger without the schools open than with them open. Uh, next is from Kevin Rogers. Uh, this is what I've been saying. Someone needs to take up the torch for what is right for the children, not the adults who are jaded by politics and self-aggrandizement. And he links to a story about uh, Betsy DeVos criticizing the 1619 Project uh, about um, history and African-American history. Next is from a parent who did not identify uh, who, uh, who did not give us a proper name. Uh, you continue to state that it is not safe to open schools because of the risk of COVID spreading through the school and causing health issues. I want the board and the administrators to take a look at attendance records for each and every school for the months of November 2019, December 2019, January 2020, and February 2020. I remember my children stating that many of their classes were nearly empty at times because of the flu. I remember seeing on Facebook parents posting how sick their kids were, and I vaguely remember one school even possibly closing for a deep cleaning. Now stop and think about that timeline. It's very possible that COVID was already here and we never knew it. Throughout uh, January and February 2020, people were reporting how sick they were and yet were testing negative for flu. So per perhaps it was COVID and you know what the children and staff recovered and life went on and so did school with additional cleaning. Now, as you look at those attendance records, compare October, November, and December 2019 to the same months in 2018. Were there significant differences? What about January and February 2020 compared to 2019? I would think you will, I would think you will see significant spikes. And while we can't prove that it was COVID because there was no testing for COVID, we can see that while there were significant illness, there were recoveries. Did we have students or teachers die from those illnesses? Not to my knowledge. We are living in a state of fear and what ifs by keeping our schools closed. Again, if you don't feel safe, don't go. The schools need to reopen. Our children need to be given a chance. Please don't hold our children back any longer. Look at the data, open the schools. Uh, next is from Annie Klupschus. I am begging you and the board to please come up with a solution to get the teachers and students who want to be back in school back in person. We know this uh, will not be all kids or all teachers. I'm begging you to please return our kids back to school in person. 
my son is struggling. My son loved school. He loved being in the classroom. He started this year with excitement for beginning trumpet and band. He's flailing and flailing at 38% now at the end of this quarter. My son needs interaction with the teacher in the classroom with peers. He's crying every day. He's lost any enthusiasm he had for learning. I'm begging you to help those who want to be back in person to get supported by those teachers who want to be back in person. I realize 100% of kids won't be back in person. I realize 10% of teachers won't want to come back in person. That helps the issue of space, PPE materials, which we have sitting around, and substitute pool numbers. I'm begging you to do the right thing before my son and countless others become a statistic. One minute remaining, Tom. All right. Uh, one next one is from Andrea Shrebat. To the board members and the superintendent, I'm looking forward to hearing what the plan is to get our children back into the classroom. You all have been stringing us along for far too long. Enough with the emotional excuses that were presented at the last Board of Education meeting. The fact is other schools in the area have figured out how to get kids back into schools with great success. Open up our schools now. Uh, and the next one, uh, probably the last one is from Carmen Gutierrez. As the parent of two PSD 202 students, I cannot express enough the disappointment in the district's inability to hear all of our voices and make a conscious effort to do what is right. We have lost more youth to suicide than COVID. The district has to be aware by now what this has done emotionally and mentally to our children. We've heard time and time again that we are a quote unquote bigger ship compared to neighboring districts. However, I believe that when students are truly at the forefront of the decision-making, then you would clearly realize the long-term impact this is having on our children and our community. Enough of the runaround. Let's put all that PPE that the district received to good use and get our kids back in our schools. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, take a break and go get a drink of water. <laughs> Um, and just uh, one thing I, I failed to mention uh, before Tom began reading those as well, uh, as I've shared previously, all of these uh, public comments, both the ones that were read as well as the entire group, even the ones we did not get to in our 20 minutes, are all shared with the entire Board of Ed uh, during each meeting or in advance of each meeting. So uh, we do all have those and uh, we'll be able to read those uh, uh, in their entirety as well um, individually. So, so thank you all very much taking the time to uh, send us public comment. Uh, we do always appreciate hearing from our community and look forward to continuing to have uh, public comment uh, you know, going forward in this format, uh, as long as we're utilizing Zoom uh, as the basis for our meetings and uh, hopefully be able to get back into uh, in-person meetings uh, with the community uh, as soon as the uh, uh, mitigation structure allows. So moving on to item six, the consent agenda. We just have one item this evening, 6.01. I'll be looking for a motion for the approval of the certified and non-certified personnel agendas both as presented. Bob's motion. Second. Heather second. Charlie, call the roll. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Drake? Yes. Mr. Westfall? Yes. Mr. Cook? Yes. Mr. Roby? Yes. Mr. Kerber? Yes, item passes. Thank you all very much. So now we can skip on down to uh, item 10 for information. And I know the item that uh, the vast majority of people that have logged on to tonight's meeting are looking forward to hearing about. Item 10.01, the return 2021 plan update. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. April and his team. Thank you, Mr. Kerberg, appreciate it. Um, yes, of keen interest is our update tonight on the return 2021 plan. And uh, we'll share with uh, the public here and the Board of Education uh, a general overview. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that really most people want to know when their student is returning, what date, what date is the plan, and those types of things. So without much further delay, uh, we will get into the, the nuts and bolts of this. Dr. Wood, uh, can you uh, display the slideshow for tonight? Yes, I think, is it visible now? 
No, it was, and then it disappeared. Oh, I, yes. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. And to review with folks, and then uh, again to get to the uh, big part, uh, and we won't spend too much time on review. But as the district has, as we have consistently said as part of our plan, we have five areas that we use to assist, and, and I want to reiterate, assist with decisions, uh, crafting the plan of return, and guiding us. Um, last board meeting and the previous board meeting, we were at two red indications on two categories. We were on two of our categories being under yellow indication and only one under green. Well, with the update as of today, two of our categories are green, two are red, one is yellow. Uh, again, the ones we use and that are under red indications now are the COVID metrics within our county and region, our substitute pool. Um, green, we've got our PPE supplies, also our cleaning and disinfecting supplies, and those are two different things. Under yellow, continues to be consistent guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health, State Board of Education, CDC, and our local county health departments. As a reminder, Plainfield District 202 serves two counties, but predominantly will, but also Kendall County. Dr. Wood, next slide. This uh, are, is numbers uh, of the positivity rate. And again, positivity rate is just one metric, but it is an important metric showing community transmission or community positivity rate or region positivity rate. And you can see uh, where it's been since December 29th. We've been tracking that. Well, we've been tracking it the whole time, but on this graph uh, is since December 29th. It also has the seven day rolling average and then the next graph is really a bar graph, uh, more of a visual and a picture, which really illustrates, I believe, we believe quite a bit. And you can see that uh, the numbers have gone up, they have gone down. If you look at where we're at now, it does appear that we're on a staircase step downward of a trend. And with that, and also, being on the cusp of the vaccine being available for educators or those who work in schools and we're classified as uh, tier 1B of the vaccination rollout, we believe that it is possible for us to return to a format of in-person learning. Now, before we get to the, to the real details of it, uh, I understand that this, uh, the plan that, that we reveal here or provide the, the details on is not going to satisfy everyone. For that, I apologize. It's not going to be full blast back five days a week, six and a half hours a day. Uh, and there's several factors and there are reasons why we can't just go back five days a week, six and a half hours a day. I know that people may not agree with all those reasons or that logic, but there are reasons. There are answers. I can't always promise that there are answers people like or that they agree with. You'll see that one more set of metrics that we look at or some others from the Will County Health Department or pertaining pr primarily to Will County have to do with the four categories of test positivity rate, new cases per 100,000, new cases in uh, or youth case increase, and then also new cases, period. Uh, Two are in the substantial or red category, and two are in minimal or blue. And again, this comes from the Will County Health Department. All of that data is available on their website. You can see we've got the data from the 18th of December, also December 11th, but we've also got it as of today. And here we go. This would be the timeline and deadlines and groups of students returning. As we did previously in the fall, we will start with pre-K-12 multi-needs and specialized programs. They will follow the same schedule as they did in the fall. Next week, we'll be starting with sixth grade, ninth grade, and grades one through 12 instructional special education students. On the 2nd of February, pre-K special ed, uh, early childhood and all day kindergarten, and then the following groups on the 8th and on the 16th. Uh, regarding students coming back, 
We would like them all to come back all at once, but the phase in model for space and for uh, monitoring of the positivity rate is what we feel is the best to do. Dr. Wood, I'm going to ask him, our uh, Glenn Wood, Dr. Glenn Wood, our Associate Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction to uh, give a little bit more information on the schedule and the slight adjustments that we have had to make to our schedule. Sure, thank you, Dr. Averill. <clears throat> when putting together a schedule, uh, there's a lot of factors to consider both externally and internally. Uh, when we've worked with our focus groups, which includes teachers, students, parents, uh, and had visited multiple other districts, a key thing that they shared with us is you wanna have a sustainable plan that you can do the longest. We feel what is presented here allows us to do that. As far as external factors, which determine uh, how our model looks, one is the Illinois State Board of Education. They request 2.5 hours of synchronous instruction, a total of five hours of uh, asynchronous plus synchronous work per day for students. This model meets those external factors. Internally, the biggest factor that we have is related to our transportation and our busing. District 202 has triple tier busing, which means one bus goes from high school to middle school to elementary to half day kindergarten, possibly preschool, those type of piece, pieces, and then back again. That being said is the biggest shift in our schedule is you look here, which would begin Tuesday, January 19th. So a week from tomorrow, we are having all, we're gonna begin our new schedule. We will, won't be hybrid at that point. Everybody will be remote but we had to adjust some times based on transportation and our triple tier busing, which leads to a little shorter day and an earlier start for high school. That is the most significant shift in this. And really it's due to our transportation, being able to provide transportation for over half of the people who requested in-person learning. And so, as you can see within our uh, schedule that's here, we have elementary, uh, full day kindergarten, AM, PM, middle school, 755 to 12, high school, 7 to 1115. During this schedule, which will begin on Tuesday, every single student will be remote initially. And so really next week at these levels, at these times, students need to log in and follow their schedule. We will have more specific schedules that are posted on our webpage. This is a general uh, big picture component of it. But we also wanted to highlight after the regular school day, a big emphasis for us this second semester is taking advantage of this time here to help kids who need more help, both online and in person. And you'll see focuses around that. Specific schools will have schedules really to engage students in targeted support, but then there will still be office hours that are listed. Another internal factor for us is uh, lunch. If you have over five hours of instruction, you must provide lunch for students. Are uh, related to safety, one of the first mitigations that takes into place is indoor dining. Uh, and so really we don't feel comfortable going over the five hours for having dining at this piece. So when you look at our internal factors of lunch and our transportation, meeting the external of the Illinois State Board of Education. What we have is a schedule here that's listed um, that will be posted that parents can follow. One other piece is our early bird. You will see at 6.23 a.m. is when they would begin uh, as we go through this. And then you know, see our a.m. and p.m. kindergarten also listed. Once we do start, so we go back and you know, February, uh, first really is when we start our hybrid uh, model. But the day and the week will look like this for our weekly schedule. It's two days in person, it's three days remote. You will have one group in person on Monday and Tuesday, then another group on Thursday and Friday. All student, uh, schools will notify parents of what group number you're in. That information should be available by the end of this week. All remote days are synchronous. Um, and so every day, uh, kids will have synchronous instruction uh, from our teachers. And then students in our specialized program, you will follow the schedule that you did already first semester. So our first group will continue to, um, you know, uh, specialized programs, continue the schedule that they've had um, overall. In hybrid mode, what happens is we have class sizes uh, that are under 14 or 15 for everyone. Most will be less uh, between elementary, middle, and high school. We believe those are safe. 
Um, and then, you know, sometimes your larger groups, your physical education, your study hall, uh, those may have a little bit larger because they have bigger spaces. Um, but we are say we've looked at the class sizes for all of our students and our schools, and we know that we can accomplish this. Um, as again, our teacher, the teacher will teach in person to our students that are here, and then they will teach remotely to our students that are synchronously. So they still follow this schedule that's listed, if you have students in front of you, then you have students that synchronously are learning. Um, once again, as we've done throughout this plan, we continue to revisit every four weeks, we continue to do updates, we look at safety metrics and, and many additional pieces for that. So this is an overview of the plan, like we had mentioned is on our website, we'll have specific uh, period breakdown for middle and high school. You can expect that your student's school will reach out to you. Uh, in the next few days and upcoming weeks related to specifics about entering school, uh, the buses and those type of things. So I don't know if there's any questions on, on the schedule that we presented here. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and let me just go over the, the kind of summary slide and then we can open it up for questions from the Board of Ed. Uh, as, as everyone's aware currently, or we should be aware, uh, we are on an adaptive pause currently, and all 11 regions of Illinois are in tier three mitigations. It does appear that many of those regions are making progress towards um, being removed from tier three. Hopefully that will continue. Um, when a community is in substantial transmission or a level of substantial transmission, the Department of Public Health does recommend that districts consider the adaptive pause and the strategies include remote learning or extending remote learning, uh, cancel extracurriculars or sports, continue meal programs. Those things are currently what we're doing. We did start, as we said earlier in the plan, uh, we had tier one students returning on October 26th. We had them in session for three weeks of school, 12 attendance days. And then the metrics and the COVID environment went in the wrong direction. And we started an adaptive pause for all students on November 16th, which did curtail other groups returning. Again, we had a plan in the fall for a return. We were able to implement a small part of that plan before the COVID environment and the COVID, COVID metrics change um, or changed and went in the wrong direction. Before Thanksgiving break, or just after I should say Thanksgiving break, we did ask parents to complete the educational choice form for uh, what they would uh, select for their student on a return between remote or in-person hybrid. And using that data uh, and the educational form, uh, working with all the scheduling logistics, receiving teacher and staff input on a return plan, it's been updated to reflect what uh, you have all seen tonight and what you will see detailed on our student or on our uh, district website, I should say. Additional content and the plan details will be published again on the website and communicated by our communications department, specifically Mr. Hernandez. This plan is very similar to what uh, geographically many of our neighbors that we touch, um, it did not drive the development of this plan we are a shade maybe later in our start or return to in-person. Some of that, a large part of that has to do with the metrics of Will and Kendall County, specifically Will really, which the majority of our students reside and come to us from Will County. But when you compare it to DuPage County, Will and Kendall County are higher on the positivity rate than DuPage County. We're hoping that additional week of our return continues to see a downward trend uh, in comparison of regions or, or specifically counties. As Dr. Wood mentioned, the daily start time and end time, why did those schedules change? Well, any daily start time and end time is driven by three factors. And one of them is busing or transportation, another is athletics, and another is band. And I've been in it 36 years here 35 years, I should say, of education. Administratively, those three factors drive the start time and the end time of a school day. And that does, in this case, specifically transportation. 
Uh, by January 15th, schools will push out information to parents regarding whether a student is in group one or group two. Uh, we also field quite a few questions or concerns from parents on extracurricular activities, whether they're athletics or non-athletics. We continue to follow the recommendations or the guidelines uh, given to us by the IHSA, which governs high school athletics. Clubs and activities when we return to in-person will begin to meet as they are allowed to or under size restrictions, depending upon what those are. Athletic practices or contact days will begin as the high school, uh, Illinois High School Association allows us to. Uh, oftentimes there's questions on vaccines. You know, are they gonna be mandatory for students? Are they mandatory for staff? Uh, currently they are not mandatory for either group. Uh, we are working with the Will, Health, Will County Health Department. And as you know, again, educators are in classification 1B or those that work in schools. And we are encouraging, strongly encouraging our staff to uh, take advantage and get that vaccine when it's available. Students will not be required to have that vaccine at least at any point in time. Uh, although they are required for other vaccines, well, the requirements of those are in the Illinois school code, which is made up of laws passed by our General Assembly. To my knowledge, our General Assembly has not and is not even entertaining the requirement of a COVID vaccine for those under the age of 18 or 16 or students. Um, again, we have a plan, we had a plan, we want to be back in person, but those timelines to come up with them is one thing. Sticking to those or being able to stick to those timelines and groups returning is another. We monitor the COVID metrics and the COVID environment. We will continue to monitor those, but on January 25th, we look forward to having our first groups of students back. I'll open it up now to board members for any questions or clarification that we could provide. All right, uh, we will take questions now from the Board of Ed for the administration. So Lane, there's been a couple people who have asked on here um, and they're good questions about our sixth graders and our ninth graders. Are they going to have any opportunity to walk their schedules or learn where their classrooms are prior to their first day of school? Or will that be something that is encompassed in the first day of school? Uh, we're working with uh, the administration at each of those levels, uh, either middle school or high school to develop some plans for those. When they do return, uh, you'll see that they, they are in the building first. Um, so they, they, when the ninth graders return, and for most of them, it'll be their first time in the building or in that high school. Uh, they'll be the only ones there and certainly we'll have some type of orientation. And more details on that will come and will come from the specific high school or specific middle school. Blaine, will um, the kids still have the same teachers for e-learning that they currently have? If, Dr. Wood can expand upon that a little bit more. Uh, we have done everything that we can to maintain continuity of teachers. Dr. Wood? Yes, almost all of our students will have their same, uh, you know, students will have their same teacher. Of course, you know, at the high school, sometimes they change courses, which would mean a different teacher uh, for that. There's uh, some movement within schedules just in a natural year, you know, um, where there may be some changes in teachers, but um, our, we're uh, confident our community will be happy with the amount of synchronous instruction with the teachers that they current ha currently have, unless they're changing uh, classes. And then uh, parents with uh, multiple kids in different schools, will they be on the same schedule? Yes, we, we've coordinated that amongst our schools. Um, so, you know, so we could, uh, those students could attend uh, school the same day. You know, there always could be some mix ups, but if they reach out with the school, we will resolve that. But that's what they've been working on uh, for the past couple of weeks. Uh, Dr. Wood, is there uh, a plan for each of the buildings that's gonna be uh, given out to the uh, parents and students on what the expectations are going to be for uh, being in the classroom, uh, book bags, coats, uh, snacks, uh, also masks, whatever. 
Yes, in addition to planning with our buildings for some transition days, as board member Drake had, had brought up, uh, the plan is that first day the group of students is in, that's an asynchronous day for the students that are remote. So really the, kid, the teachers can uh, you know, go over some of those pieces, make sure that uh, safety protocols and the way things operate both in the school and the classroom, that they're very clear um, and have no questions moving forward. Could you uh, also expound on uh, what would be the maximum number of students in a classroom at the elementary level, middle school and high school level? We've, and Mrs. Griffith could do this too, but I'll, I'll just start uh, under 14, at 14 or under at the elementary, uh, 15 or under at the middle school and 14 or under at the high school. Some of our physical education classes with bigger spaces, uh, you know, have different numbers for that. We have looked at that sectioning uh, and we're confident that all of our classes will be uh, smaller than those um, sizes that I mentioned. And what about the buses? If uh, again, uh, with the buses, if a child uh, is found to have COVID, what would happen? Sure. So I can answer that one. Um, so first, all of our students will be expected to wear a mask on the bus. Um, we will have as we will follow the requirements for ISBE for the number of students that can be on a bus at one time. So the max number of students on a bus is fifty. Um, we do believe, based on the responses from the educational choice form, that we will have significantly less students on the bus. So if a student is diagnosed with COVID, the recommendations from ISBE and IDPH is that the students th seated three rows in front, three rows behind, directly next to, and again, three rows in front, three rows in back, would be required to quarantine. There is a possibility that we would require more to be quarantined. However, that is the recommendation right now from IDPH and ISB. Would that be the same with the classroom situation? So the classroom situation is a little different. Um, we are, the way we are setting up majority of our classrooms is that students will be seated six feet apart, nose to nose. The current recommendation is that students that would be immediately around the individual that was diagnosed would have to quarantine if that student that was diagnosed was in school on a day that they would be considered contagious. So it would not necessarily be the whole class. I will tell you though, that in, um, at points that we had a high positivity rate within the community, we did receive direction from the Will County Health Department that an entire class would have to quarantine. So it really depends on the situations and where our level of community spread is at the time the individual is diagnosed. But Currently in writing, it, it would be students that would be directly surrounding the student that was diagnosed, not the entire class. And is it yeah, and, uh, in... Mr. Smith, just to um, add on to uh, Mina's answer about the buses, if uh, we have a bus situation where a student on the bus has COVID, that bus will be taken out of service for the day and be deep cleaned on, um, and then after a waiting period, will be put back into rotation. So we wouldn't continue to use that bus as well. And Thank Nina, you. is it still that Will County is recommending the 14 days or has there been any consideration or of the there seven to 10? That's a great question, Mike. And I will tell you uh, we, that, that answer the county has gone back and forth on since mid-December. So currently um, the, the required days of quarantine have not changed for an individual that was diagnosed with COVID. That is still the 10 days from the first date of symptoms or from the first date where the, the individual tested positive. The only dates that changed were for students or staff that were directly exposed. So they did clarify um, that they are recommending, and they have said this over and over, they are still recommending a 14-day quarantine for anyone that is directly exposed to an individual with COVID. However, staff and students can consider a 10-day we, we can consider a 10 day quarantine for staff and students who are directly exposed with some very specific criteria. Um, so we will look to consider that, but one of the criteria that would need to be in place is that if and when they return to the school setting, they are required to follow the mask mandate, the stay within six feet apart at all times. So there are, it, it, it is a little challenging to reduce down to the 10 day quarantine the seven day quarantine is not an option for students. We cannot even consider that in the school setting. So 
there is some wiggle room and we are looking at the reduced 10 day quarantine um, and we'll consider if we are able to do that for some students and staff in the district. Uh, Mina, uh, the district has been working with the Will County Health Department on uh, developing a plan to provide a timeline and for vaccination for our staff members in the district. So we are we are in close communication with the Will County Health Department. At this time, they are providing the vaccine to Group 1A, which is medical professionals, um, emergency response. Teachers, are, teachers and educational staff are in Group 1B. We are in communication with them, and we actually just recently surveyed our nurses and our staff about their willingness to get the vaccine, as well as if any of our medical staff are willing to actually provide the vaccine. And we are putting together a plan for when the county tells us that they are ready to provide the vaccine to staff. At this point, we have no date of when that might be. Um, we have not been provided any direction from the Will County Health Department as to how to set up plans to give the vaccine. Um, however, we are working on plans and in weekly communication with the health department. Dr. Abel, do you have anything else to share on that? I know we've both been in, in that communication. Not really, other than I can tell you it is a, a not only of myself as superintendent, but all of the superintendents, school superintendents in Will County, a keen topic of interest on getting the vaccine available for our staff um, and, and folks who work in schools. Um, it's, it's a hot topic of discussion and we have all pledged to the Will County Health Department to, uh, for them to just let us know their needs and we'll open our buildings. Our nurses are willing to assist as our school nurses and, and many, many other uh, school districts in Will County, and you know we want to we want to get that rolling for sure. There are quite a few questions where people are trying to understand what a classroom is going to look like um, with students in the classroom, as well as some remote. Are there any any way we can try to explain a little bit to the parents as to what that's going to look like? Yes, we do have some videos too that we will post on the website that they can see. But generally the kids, what happens is the instructional model is the kids at home are projected on the screen and the kids at home are on Zoom. The kids in the classroom do not have to be on Zoom. In fact, we recommend that they are, they don't. And now they could still use their computers to do things for Google Classroom or those type of components of it. Um, but through our one we bought, we purchased speakers, not for everybody, but we have uh, speakers uh, that the kids both in the class and at home can hear each other. We also know how you can um, uh, uh, hear through our speaker and projector system. So we have a video where to each the teachers can, you don't need necessarily need the speakers. You can do it through our projectors as well um, that have a speaker. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. And, and, and just to clarify for everyone as well, um, all the information that has been presented tonight will be available um, after this meeting on the district website, along with, uh, again, additional resources that will be put out, uh, you know, in the coming days as we move toward this for both families, as well as there will be communication to our teaching staff and uh, support staff, uh, you know, in the buildings as well to give uh, additional clarification. We, this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, you know, answer to every question here this evening. I don't think that's really feasible for us to do, but we also recognize that there are plenty of questions that people will have. So you know, we, we encourage everyone to, again, view, view the website, the information that's available there, the information that will come out from Mr. Hernandez, the information that will come out from your individual buildings as, you, uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, between now and uh, the 25th and then the subsequent dates from there, um, as well as, uh, again, for our staff to, uh, you know, await additional information um, for, you know, from your respective building leadership and others uh, across the district so that you'll have all the information that everyone will need to uh, answer, uh, hopefully every question that someone uh, could have, would have. Um, but, but again, thank you for, for all the questions. Uh, you know, that I know the community will have. And uh, again, we'll, we'll make every effort to get uh, all of those uh, um, answered going forward as well. So um, uh, additional questions from the board for the administration uh, comments? Uh, 
Dr. Averill, all 30 buildings are ready and ready to go. Our, uh, yes, they are. Operationally, our maintenance staff, uh, as we are with in contact with them every day, have assured us that filters are up to speed, ventilation is occurring as it should. Um, we have hallways designated as one way. We have um, drinking fountains, except for the water bottle filling station part, disabled traditional drinking fountains, all of those types of things. And, and again, um, you know, an all exhaustive list, we will try to answer in writing all of the questions. And to Mr. Kerberg's point, you know, we're receiving questions about what about high school parking permits? What about, uh, you know, passing periods? All of those types of things. This information will be on our website. Mr. Hernandez and our communications department do a fantastic job of updating that and, and putting as much as he can immediately after this meeting is over and we will parse through the questions or go down the list of questions that we've received in the chat room. Um, I'm not sure I can answer every what if at this moment in time uh, regarding everything or every question that's been asked, but certainly we'll make our best attempt to do that. And uh, I wanna thank the Board of Education for their support in our plan. We do want students to return. Our teachers want students to return I'm confident that we're gonna get there. We need some cooperation from the COVID metrics and the community in the spread and all of those types of things, but I believe we're gonna get there. Thanks, uh, Dr. Abril. And, and, and again, we, we certainly as a Board of Ed understand the, the many, many, many questions that uh, all of this return um, poses for those uh, you know, in the community with students uh, that are uh, coming back to school that you're entrusting to us, uh, for our staff uh, that are, are you know, taking uh, a, the next step in this process as well. So again, we, we, we want to be partners in all of this with everyone in the community to ensure that, uh, again, we get the information out that everyone uh, needs. Um, but, but again, you know, that's why we're also giving the announcement today with the first groups um, scheduled for two weeks from now so that we, you know, we'll, we'll provide that opportunity to you know, get that information out to you to answer those questions. And, uh, and, and, and again, you know, make sure that we try to put as much of the anxiety um, uh, at ease as we can for everyone, students, families, staff, teachers, uh, as we uh, move forward with this next step and then going forward really for the, the balance of the 2020-2021 of the school year. Anything else from the Board of Ed? Just, I just wanna reiterate um, kind of what Dr. Abril was saying and that is that we all need to do our part. Um, yes, masks will need to be worn in the classroom, um, but people should be wearing them in public and everywhere else. The, more we can follow the CDC guidelines of wearing masks and social distancing, uh, the faster we can get rid of this thing. Thank you, Heather. Anything else? Yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to say there was a question about Wilco. And uh, as the head of Wilco, our administration is working with all of the school districts that take part uh, with their timelines for return to in-person learning and then more information will be available shortly on the Wilco website. Thank you, Rod. I assume that uh, since the next item on the agenda is Wilco report uh, an update, I assumed you'd be giving us that at that point in time, but just before we get there, just wanna uh, offer one last time if there's anything else from the Board of Ed uh, regarding the return plan for the administration. I just want to thank them for the work they're putting into this, Mr. Kerber, uh, Dr. Eberle and his administration staff and uh, departments have, uh, have put a lot of plan into this. And so it's going to work. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Very well said. And uh, the, the positivity is uh, uh, hopefully will be infectious and, uh, you know, everyone will take that same uh, approach as we uh, we go forward collectively as a community uh again to to ensure that this that this works uh, all right uh rod um for the vacation report for wilco 
Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Wilco, we met on uh, Tuesday, December 15th at 6 o'clock at the Wilco Career Center. Uh, we approved expenditures presented for payment for December in the amount of $113,755.36. We also uh, approved uh, our budget amendment as uh, we're still waiting for some funds to come from state grants, which are slow, slowly being processed. Um, and then we also uh, have some HOSA state qualifiers, which are the future health professionals. Uh, I would like to uh, let every bolt, everybody know that a Norma Nadine from Plainfield East qualify for C CPR, first aid emergency preparedness events. Ayet Kizmi from Plainfield South qualified for CPR, first aid emergency preparedness events, and also medical terminology, health science related events. Majura Nedum from Plainfield South qualified for dental science health professional events and dental terminology health science related events. Cameron Aquinas from Plainfield East qualified for job seeking skills leadership events, medical spelling health science related events and sports medicine health professional events. And Sarah Reyes from Plainfield East qualified for medical terminology health science related events. And also our Wilco students of the quarter, Joseph Storitz, Auto Service, Senior at Plainfield Central. Elvis Lemby Landu, Computer Technology, Junior at Plainfield Central. Cassandra Sawinski, Criminal Justice, Senior at Plainfield North. Ethan Herner, Criminal Justice, Junior at Plainfield North. Francis Rose Desette, Early Childhood, Senior at Plainfield Central. Keegan Daly, Fire Science, Junior at Plainfield North. Ashton Mutnaski, Game Design, Senior at Plainfield Central. Jessica Divas, Welding One, Senior at Plainfield Central. Stephen Marino, Welding Two, Senior at Plainfield East. I'll pass these along to you, Tom, so uh, you can uh, put them on the website. That's my report, Kevin. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, January 21st. Thank you, Rod. And uh, on behalf of the Board of Education, congratulations to all of those students for their accomplishments. Great to hear that. All right, uh, we have one additional uh, four information item, so 10.04 other, and this uh, relates to the resignation that we have received from a board member, um, Joette Doyle. And so um, I have a letter uh, to read um, from her to the Board of Ed and the community. Uh, it uh, states, it is with great sadness that effective immediately, I am resigning as a member of the Board of Education of Plainfield School District 202. Over the past six months, I have had some significant health issues that have changed my ability to be a committed and productive board member. My health journey is far from over and going forward, I need to concentrate on my health and caring for my family. I will be forever grateful to my fellow board members, Dr. April, the administration, staff, and the community of District 202 for the opportunity to serve and work to provide the best education to the students of our district. I've enjoyed my time as a board member and will miss everyone. Thank you much for your understanding. Respectfully, Joette Doyle. So um, just as a, a few additional words uh, on uh, Joette. Joette was uh, elected to the Board of Education in April of 2019. She worked hard to learn how a very large governmental system works and quickly made valuable contributions to the board's work. We certainly understand and on behalf of the Board of Education, we applaud Mrs. Doyle for her courage and thank her for her dedication, hard work, passion and service to District 202. Most especially though, we wish her a speedy recovery and good health going forward. Mr. Hernandez will be publishing information tonight about the process to fill Mrs. Doyle's seat through the end of her term in 2023. But just uh, uh, to provide a synopsis of that, by statute, the Board of Education has 60 days to fill the role with our appointment. 
So the uh, information will go out uh, shortly from Mr. Hernandez uh, into the community, asking for those that are interested uh, in um, uh, seeking uh, the, the, the appointment to, to this seat to submit their uh, information. The emails must include the applicant's qualifications and statement explaining their interest in becoming a Board of Education member and why they would be an asset or valuable member to the District 202's Board of Education. The deadline we have set for uh, these, uh, for, for these uh, um, statements to be submitted to us is January 22nd. And our expected appointment would occur by uh, the February 22nd uh, scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, again, we have 60 days to uh, fill the role uh, with the appointment by statute. Uh, you know, we will um, identify uh, the uh, proper candidate uh, candidates that we would um, reach out to for uh, additional information and uh, share the, the next steps in the process with them uh, going forward uh, over the next uh, month to uh, 45 days or so. And then again, look to make that uh, appointment um, by the February 22nd uh, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. So. Um, Again, thank you to Joette for all of your uh, contributions to the Board of Ed. We regret that you uh, will no longer be able to serve with us. And we do look forward to the uh, opportunity to uh, fill the seat uh, going forward. And that, again, that person that is uh, uh, appointed by the Board of Ed will serve the balance of uh, Joette's uh, term, which will go until the election in the spring of 2023. All right. Um, that is all we have. We don't have any unfinished or new business. So freedom of information status uh, report, Dr. Abram. Yes, we have received three freedom of information requests since the last Board of Education meeting. Number one from Raj Pela, community member for materials regarding budget and expenses. That was received on January 4. It was withdrawn on January 4. Secondly, we have Nora Dalton, a community member for materials regarding someone named Dr. Abril and his contract. That was received January 4, withdrawn on January 4. Uh, just as a point of interest, uh, my contract is and has been on the district website ever since I became employed. Number three, uh, Siegel Rothman, uh, retained equity LLC for materials regarding uncashed or unclaimed checks between January 1st in, of 2017 and June 30th of 2020. That was received December 20 and due January 22nd, 2021. That is in progress. Thank you, Dr. Abril. 14.01, uh, announcements and scheduled activities. We have uh, Monday, January 18th, Martin Luther King Jr. birthday. Uh, we will not be in session in recognition. We have remote committee meetings on Wednesday, January 20th, 2021, 6 p.m. for curriculum and tech, 6 p.m. on site and finance. Next Board of Education meeting will be held remotely on Monday, January 25th, 2021, 6.30 for closed session, 7.30 for general public session. Thank you, sir. And we will not have a second closed session, so we are looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Bob's motion. Second. Heather's second. Charlie? Ms. Drake? Yes. Mr. Westfall? Yes. Mr. Cook? Yes. Mr. Roby? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Ker Kerberg? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much and uh, have a wonderful evening.